We can hear you now. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Guru Maharaj, for this very exhaustive list. On the subject of criticism of devotees, I remember after you had given class to, uh, I think, Hare Krishna, South Africa, Sahadev Prabhu was the host. He was talking about the culture, uh, especially in South Africa. He was mentioning that we do not speak anything in, uh, that may be even misconstrued as criticism, especially of senior devotees. But then what has happened? Because of that, so much wrongdoing has taken place because nobody wants to speak up. And atrocities, abuse, so many things happen. So he was saying that uh, we should not allow these things to happen. Can you just help us to understand how to navigate such situations? Well, you're not criticizing the person, you're criticizing the activity. You have to devoid the person from the activity. If something is wrong and it's, it's affecting both the person and someone else, there should be some effort to correct it. If you can do it in such a way that it doesn't cause greater, what we say, controversy, difficulty, fine. But if you can't, then find someone who can. So when senior devotees are off, the best thing to do is to go to another senior devotee and explain and ask him to make that, or mask her or mask him, to make that, you know, adjustment. Because sometimes when we try to do it, it's not accepted or seen as another form of criticism. But if there is a deviation that's being expanded or expounded upon, that's going to cause problems with everyone, who either those who hear it or those who believe it. They might be affected so that to protect everyone, therefore these types of things must be adjusted and put into the right perspective. Prabhupada was very strong on this, especially when it came to the philosophy. He didn't tolerate any deviations in the philosophy. He was like fire when it came to that. But he wasn't criticizing the person. He was making, putting under, giving the right understanding, that's all. Yes, Janava, yeah. Okay, there, there's a microphone. Mataji once said that um, mental speculation is bad, but philosophical speculation is good. So that when we read scriptures, we are actually using our intelligence to understand it and to have a more broad vision. So I'm just wondering, when you said about the philosophy, how do we know if we are bringing in Mayavadi philosophy or we are using our intelligence to understand scriptures better? Well, you can understand them from, from Guru, from Shastra. Knowledge is given to us by these three forms, Guru, Shastra, and Sadhu, 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 Guru, Shastra. We check and understand. If we have some understanding of the philosophy after reading it, then we're, if we're not sure, if it's not clear, then we try to reference that somewhere and find something that cooperates with it or criticizes it and says that it's off, you know. So we have that, that knowledge available. So when you, re when you read something and you're not sure what it means, you can either ask someone 
who is qualified to answer, or you can reference that knowledge from Guru or Sadhu, Sadhu Shastra, like that. Yeah, and that that's the safe way. <laughs> Yes, uh, Raj Prabhu. Um, just going to the point about um, criticism of Buddhism. Just going to the point about criticism of, um, of people and, and situations. So, you were saying how advanced people see no fault. Hmm? You're saying how advanced people see no fault in others. How they... How somebody that's really advanced, they yeah. don't see any faults. That's, that's on the highest platform, yeah. And you said that one way is to separate the criticism with, like, separate criticism the person versus the activity. Yeah. So, I was just thinking that... Hate the sinner, not the sin. That's what they, that's the Christian tradition, they say. So in our movement, like we have obviously some sometimes things can happen where it's not actually correct, or there's a philosophical slight deviation. Um, I could give an example, but I don't know if it's controversial and I should say it or not. Okay, you just you can go ahead and explain. I should say it. If you don't, it's up to you if you want to say um, it or not say it. For example, like okay, so for example, we see like some criticism. Certain swamis coming out of criticism on YouTube. For example, on uh, publicly, but not actually confronting the person directly. So, how do you, how do you like navigate that? Because how do you understand that? Because uh, if somebody is going against the philosophy or going against like what Prabhupada has said, uh, so rather than approaching that that person or that sannyasi directly, they would openly speak out about it. So, how do you? Sort of and if you believe, and if you believe that, then you also are on the same mentality as the person who's criticizing. So they're, they're criticizing the activity, but should they not be speaking to that person directly rather than publicly? Yeah, yeah, that's that's the proper way to do it. Yeah, otherwise, it's offensive. Clearly, an offense. To speak about somebody's apparent faults, because every side has, every story has two sides. <laughs> you're only hearing one side. <laughs> and even after you hear the other side, you're still not sure. <laughs> because when people have something between each other, usually there's a misunderstanding or a miscommunication that doesn't allow them to see the whole picture, and therefore criticism comes, usually. So the, the best thing is just to avoid such things. Unless it's a philosophical thing. If it's a philosophical thing, then you can deal with it and check it out and see if it's right or it's in line with our practice or not. But if it's a a personal fault where someone's criticizing a person's character or behavior, then that's different. Because we don't know why a person may be behaving like that. There are examples that people act in the wrong way. I mean, they Prabhupada was criticized for things that he did, but they, they saw the activity, but they didn't see the motivation behind it. Like when Prabhupada was in Calcutta, he was with his devotees, and they were at one life member's house, a very respectable family, and they were serving prasadam. And so the the host served onion pakoras. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, this is onion, Prabhupada said, never mind, eat it. <laughs> he didn't want to offend the host. Now, you might say, well, why is Prabhupada saying that? But there's a motivation why he did that. Just like people, there was one devotee who said, Prabhupada, 
when I, he was preaching in Russia. He says, there's nothing to eat here, Prabhupada. I, I'm starving. Prabhupada said, eat meat, but just preach. <laughs> so well, people will criticize that. But that's time, place, and circumstance. And, and it's not simply a principle. It's an emergency statement. A lot of statements are given according to preaching activity. Jiva Goswami is also criticizing for giving higher priority to Swakya Bhava as opposed to uh, Parakya Bhava. But we know the Shastras and the, the Charyas talk that Parakya Bhava is superior to Swakya Bhava. But Jiva Goswami did the opposite. And he's criticized for that. But he had a reason for doing that because they were misusing Parakya Bhava. So to put Parakya Bhava on a level in a different way, he example he he gave Swakya Bhava a higher principle. That was a preaching tactic. <laughs> so, so if you see the thing as it is, but don't know the motivation behind it, then you might you you can misjudge easily. Yeah, Krishna told, you know, Yudhisthir to tell a lie. <laughs> the Supreme Personality of Godhead is telling somebody to tell a lie. And he couldn't do it. Yudhisthir was so dharmic that he couldn't tell a lie. And then when he didn't tell a lie, he, he told a lie, but he told it in a a sophistry, which means half truth, half lie. And Krishna, Krishna didn't like that. So it said Yudhisthira had to see hell because he refused to obey Krishna when Krishna told him to tell a lie. And we know lying is wrong. <laughs> so you, when you don't see the whole picture or don't know the motivation behind, better to remain neutral until more, if you want to investigate, that's fine, but yeah. Hmm. Did you get that one? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah. So you, you come this evening for Kirtan? Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming and enlivening us. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Oh, Jashwi Prabhu ki Mataji ki Thank you. Yeah. So you mentioned about Taranga Rakhidi. And I remember before you made a point, not in this class, but before, um, you made a point that um, as devotees we praise each other. And what can happen is if you, if you believe them, you're in trouble. So if, if it you can you, be, yeah. If you actually believe them. And what you said was when you're doing service, um, we can get proud and Krishna will give you small purification. If... If it, if it becomes continuous, you will. If you just become proud from one situation, then you realize, oh, I, I acted wrong. But if you continually act in the wrong way, then Krishna will do something to show you where you really are. <laughs> but not just one incident that happens, you know. So how do we check that? that with these small incidences, like how can you sense check that you're becoming proud? Or what's like an indicator? Is it like, obviously chanting can help, but is there well, any way you can actually put yeah. a system where... Yeah, when you walk into the room and everybody says, Jai, there's a few people that don't, and you say, what's wrong with them? <laughs> That's one way. <laughs> and another way is, yeah, all right, so you're a senior person and someone cuts in front of you and does, ignores you and you think, oh, what's he doing? He doesn't know who I am. Yeah. 
uh, so these are little examples by how you can see that you have a certain attitude towards yourself that is really not ideal, or you say in line with what we say, Vaishnava humility. You can check yourself, how you respond to situations, or how you don't respond to situations. But it's not always that easy. <laughs> I'm not saying it's that easy. Because there's so many innuendos and so many other subtle aspects to relationships that really are need, under, needed to be understood before you can understand the whole process. Really, before you can understand a per, uh, why a person does something or something about that person, you have to really know the person. I mean, there's a, I don't want to go into it, but Prabhupada's being criticized, even today, for certain things he said. But he said it in a certain context. And that context is exactly correct. And they just take the statement out of the context and criticize the statement. Even Prabhupada, even Krishna gets criticized. <laughs> Krishna says, I'm not going to fight, and he fights. Right? He lies. <laughs> but he, why did he fight? Why did he say, I'm not going to fight? Because there's a higher principle when his devotee is in trouble. And he will break his promise just to protect his devotee. That's his love for his devotee. Let's take a, let's take Sukhavaha's question. Oh, we have, okay, Elena, you had one also? Yes. Okay, what time is it now? 12.40, and the next session is at what? 2.30. 2.30, it's almost two hours, right? We can go for 10 more minutes, five more minutes. Is that all right? Um, you're in charge, I'm just trying to... Five more minutes. Okay. I promise. <laughs> Five more minutes, okay. Yes. Because this, this is really an important topic. It is. It's, that's why I don't want to really minimize it. You know? dei devoti che hanno una naturale propensione a, a proteggere gli altri e come possiamo gestire al meglio questa attitudine possiamo chiedere a Krishna di, di darci la forza di essere un rifugio amorevole per gli altri e io penso che il rischio è quello di sacrificare molto più del necessario oppure di creare una sorta di dipendenza negli altri e però quando possiamo riconoscere che questa dipendenza è sana so she's saying there are, are devotees that have a natural propensity to protect others and so how can we best um, deal with this attitude? Uh, should we ask Krishna to give us the strength so that we can give this uh, shelter in a loving way or is it risky to sacrifice ourselves more than what is necessary and also create a sort of... Um, um, uh, depend, depend, depend. Yeah. Like a drug. Yes. <laughs> addiction. Uh, addiction. Yes. Okay. But is it like a, Is this like an addiction? Is like, is it okay? Is it healthy? Is it healthy to give protection to the devotees? Yes, when there is too much, uh, too much of the heart being given to that situation. She's saying like, what is, you know, like the, like sometimes we're giving too much and when do we understand, you know, when it's a problem? Well, I use an, I use an analogy to answer. If you go to a doctor and you have a, 
uh, an ailment, he's going to try to give you the medicine or whatever you need to cure. But that he doesn't have to get sick in order to understand your situation. So we shouldn't try to... Uh, we can empathize without actually being putting ourselves in the position of that other devotee. Because then you can't really help anybody and you're not helping yourself either. You have to stay above it so you can give advice or shelter or whatever. In other words, you have to be a little bit neutral so you're not affected. It's like you're, you're helping others, but at the same time, that, that has nothing to do with you. You're just giving the formula for help. You don't have to try to feel like that or be like them in order to understand the situation. Because then you could for you get yourself into that mood of, you know, losing your, what we say, position as, a, as someone who can help someone that comes in to cry and they're, they're coming to you with crying and if you start crying with them, it's like, what can you do to help them? You have to stay somewhat above it. But that, that's not for everybody. You have to be qualified to do that. And there's people who are not qualified and try to become someone's shelter. They can't really give that shelter. There's a certain qualification that has to be there. Because a lot of, a lot of time, <coughs> people, uh, <coughs> because a lot of time, people and also the body is not able to ask uh, um, help me. And uh, uh, but when you give the love, uh, when you give the when when you give love to the body or also know the body, appreciate, but sometimes yes, sometimes no. Yeah, no, I can tell you, I had a personal experience with Bhakti Tirtha Swami. Uh, people would come to see him with problems, I mean not just small problems, big problems. And he would take time with devotees. And I would, and I would be there also. And one time I said to him, Mara, what do you say to all these people? He says, I hardly say anything, I just listen. He said, that's all they really need, somebody to talk to. Someone who cares. Someone they can express their feelings, and someone who is really sympathetic to hear and try to offer some advice. But he says, I don't say that very much. But he does say something. But he's saying they just want to speak. They need someone to talk to. And that's, they, when they start talking about their own problems to a, a, an empathetic ear, they start seeing the solution sometimes simply by their own speaking. Okay. Sukhavaha? Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> okay. Uh, Anuradha? You gotta push that button somewhere. Okay, um, thank you for the class, Maharaj. Uh, I was thinking about a Prabhupada when he was um, talking with uh, people in general, how he was uh, expressing anger. And I was thinking about one analogy, like we can use some tool like hammer or something and we can use it once and the problem is when we met devotees and you mentioned that we are not happy uh, seeing a devotee or not behaving properly toward a devotee and not uh, praising devotee properly and then a Prabhupada was a good example and he was angry 
at the right place, circumstance, and he was empowered by Krishna. And he was angry properly. But in our, um, sometimes we need to be very careful that, like that hammer I mentioned before, we use once and not the whole day because otherwise we ruin everything what is around us and put it down yeah. the box where the hammer belongs to. Yeah, Prabhupada could be angry, but in the next moment it's like it never happened. In other words, the anger didn't affect him, he used it for a purpose, that's all. Like using, like the example you gave, using a tool, but you just use it, that's all. You don't become the tool. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, Krishna. See you later, Bhagavad Gita. Salute Maharaj. <laughs>